Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Axminster Tools head office here in delightful Devon. We're here once again in the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. I've got um, Colwyn Way answering your questions today or helping with the questions. And I've got Jason behind the camera. So please, as I go along, if you get any questions, please let us know. And in fact, today has been, uh, today's video has been, been led by yourselves. It's been uh, quite a popular request for another routing style video, which is what's happening today. And today we're looking at the mitre lock cutter. So a really good box style making, super strong, quite simple once you get your head around it. And that's what I'm here for today really is to give you a few hints and tips along the way. This is the cutter in question, the mitre lock cutter. As said, great for making boxes, super strong joints, really quick and easy to do, um, providing, you know, one or two little tips and tricks. And as I said, that's what I'm here for today. So let's get stuck in and have a real close look at this cutter. So Jace, if we can go on to a camera three, my friend, and there we go. Look at that. That's straight into what we're doing today. Now, this is the Mitolox cutter. This is the mitre lock in its kind of flat, almost kind of setup style mode. And over here, you can see the mitre lock joint. This joint is a dream to come together. Very simple to clamp, super strong. And it is, in fact, a combination of two cuts. It's a bevel cut, kind of on a 45 degree, hence the mitre, as you can see. So it's kind of that style of cutter. Bevel cutter, this one, a well-used bevel cutter, as you can tell, and a combination of this tongue and groove kind of finger joint cutter. So it's a combination of these two making this joint possible. Now, let's have a look at the cutter itself. There we go. We can see we've got, let me get a pencil. We've got a mitre. These flat faces here and here is the mitre. And halfway through, we've got the locking part of it. Alignment for this joint is super. Comes in three sizes from Max Minster Tools. We've got the big boy. Now, this big fella will do 13 to 25 millimeter material. Okay. There's one in between, which we're going to use today. This one. This one will do 10 to 18 millimeters material. And then you've got the little one. Quarter inch shanks, so that's good. So even if you're running a small router in your router table, you can still do this style of joint. Slightly smaller, thinner material, nine to 13 millimeters in board thickness. And when I'm talking board thickness, I'm talking this thickness, how thick it is here. The cutter I'm gonna to use today is the middle size one. So let me pop those out of the way for a minute. We'll come back to that, all right? And let's have a look at the joint itself. So it's a end grain style joint. What I mean by that is this is cut end grain. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a tough cut normally. But again, with the right setup, the right speed and stuff, it is pretty simple to do. And there we go. And you see how well that comes together. Crucial, two points are crucial. You need to ascertain, need to find out where the center of the cutter is. Because that's going to be the center of your board. Now, the center of the cutter, let me get the big one. It's probably a bit easier to show you on the big one. The center of the cutter is actually, let me orientate that so you can see it better. Center of the cutter is this point here. All right. That knuckle, that little corner just there. All right. Or in fact, just beyond there, because this is an angle. It's ever so slightly sloping up. Um, so it's kind of halfway along that slope there. And that shows, that gives you your midway point. And it's just as simple as send, setting a, a midway point on your board, you know, halfway through the thickness of your material. Now, what I'm working on here, I'm going to be machining some of this stuff. I've got four lovely pieces of macro carper. So it's kind of a, a, a conifer style tree, uh, indigenous to California and New Zealand. Um, kind of a bit like cedar. You've got that kind of feel and smell to it, but not quite as splintery as cedar. And this one is 18 mil in thickness. 
All right. 18. Half 18 is nine. So what I need to do is make a nine mil center mark on my board. Nine mil center mark. However you want to do that is entirely up to you. Um, so if we can go back to the main cam, camera one, Jace, just for a second. So we've got to mark center of our board. And as I said, however you do that is entirely up to you. You could just use a little, little gadget like this that you make. Twist, plonk. There you go. Central line. You could get yourself a set of calipers, get all a little bit more precise about it. All right. We could do that. You know, 18 mil, half is nine to make a little scribe line there. All right. Or you could use something like this one. If we come back to three then, Jace, please. All right. Something like this where it gives you the, oh, let's unlock it, gives you the thickness of the material. Okay. And then you, you drop this down halfway through. Digital scale will read. Okay. I'm going to go with the this method i like the calipers so as said 18 move my caliper to nine there we are and then i know there's a few engineers amongst you probably are going to scream now I'm me doing this with a set of calipers so just there just make a little scribe line down the middle of my board i'm just going to exaggerate that with my pencil so it's a bit clearer for you guys and there we go just as said, a midway point of my board. Now it's time to load the cutter in. Once we've got that midway point, it's time to load the cutter in. So let's do that. I'm going to clear the table for a moment. Lots of stuff on the table. Now lots of stuff on the floor. All right. And that's the cutter we're going to be using. As I said, it's the middle size cutter we're going to be using today. And all these setup tips are the same regardless. So let's get our router from underneath the router table. There we go. This posh one's nice and easy to work with. Make sure it's unplugged. And I like to put it in the, the plunging base. I've got the fixed base underneath the machine. Plunging base. All right, so we can go to camera two. Beautiful. And then the cutter goes in. Before I put the cutter in, I'm just going to look on the shank of the cutter to see what the maximum running speed of this is. All right, you can't see it there. We've got some information there. It's got a K-line, so minimum insertion into the router. And it's got some, uh, some other details, diameters, and most importantly, the maximum running speed. 1,600 RPM on this one. So make a mental note of that, Craig. Lock this in position. Oh, other end. There we are. I can come out of there now and be loaded straight in under me, into my router table there. There we go. All right. And you can see that cutter there. So if you can go to camera three, Jace. There we go. We can just see the cutter coming through. It's not locked off because we're a bit wobbly to wobbly. But what I need to do now, I need to get that bit of wood back and I need to find center. I need to align my centers. So, where's my center line? There it is. All right. I can line that up just on the edge of the board. In fact, I'll make my mark on the edge of the board. It might be a bit easier. There we go. Little center. Now, remember where we need to be. Let's line up this corner with my pencil mark. All right. Just making sure we're flat down onto the table. And there we are. Now, this rarely happens first hit. You normally are going to make a micro adjustment afterwards. And I can talk about that. I can show you how to do that. All right. But what I'm, I'm there or thereabouts with my, my cutter height. I've got a big hole around my cutter here, so I'm going to try and close that down a little bit. Close that aperture. I've got an insert ring here. It's always good to try and close that gap around the cutter as much as possible. So 
and see there we've just closed that in just to stop the timber really from dipping into that hole so that's one measurement in place next measurement which is also crucial is bringing the fence into position because not enough cut you're not going to get a closed joint too much cut you're going to end up with a little bit of kind of what they call snipe and i'll exaggerate that in a moment so you're sliding on through and the last little bit of cut drops back onto the fence and gives you a little scallop out the end and that isn't what we're looking for we want a nice clean straight through cut so i'm closing these fences down as close as i can i'm pushing these fences together and i'm going to lock them off there may be some minor adjustment to that in a moment or two okay so what about this other measurement? What about getting the fence in the right place? Well, that's an easy thing to do as well. So we're back to our existing material. And all setup is done in the horizontal mode with the board horizontal. If you're creating a corner joint, we're going to be doing one, once we've done the setup and we're happy with levels, one board like that, next board vertical. One horizontal, next vertical. But all setup is done the board horizontal now this is the kind of bit that i think a few people struggle with is getting this cutter now the fence rather in the right position in relation to the cutter now the way i've done it for a while and i've made a few boxes using these cutters they're really cool cutters is really we've just gotta put our material on there put a flat straight edge on there and then we want our rule just to touch the cut in this position. You turn that rule around. You just want to get this tip of the cutter just touching the tip, the underside of this rule. All right. And we can lock one end off and then micro adjust from the other end. All right. Is it touching? Now, that's, see, that's too much. That's going to remove too much material. So I just got to bring that back. Just make that minor minor adjustment these are minor adjustments if you've got fine adjustment on your fence all good and well all right just kissing that rule now just in that point there hoping you can see that area there that's just the critical point so where we're at now is we've got cutter set to the right height to this this pencil mark and the fence set to the right dimension just so let's do a test cut that's the only way to really tell let's do a test cut all right okay so we've got a fairly large cutter we're doing end grain so there's going to be a bit of resistance there so i want to try and contain and control this as much as possible Not the biggest piece of material um so what i'm going to do i'm going to just drop in a little feather board just to help keep the material pushed down to the, the table. So let's just slide that on in. These things are great. It just saves having to get your fingers too close to the cutting area. And they just get kind of pushed halfway along the cut. And then some light pressure down there. All right, let's do that up. Even, oops, not tight enough. There we go. All right, and the fingers flex as you're coming through and put downward pressure to save you having to put pressure there to ensure the board doesn't lift. All right. That feels really quite safe and stable. It's all enclosed and guarded. All right. Check the speed. So whenever I put in a new cutter, I always wind the speed down to zero. Um, it should be a given with any variable machine that you're loading in new tooling, new cutters, wind it down to zero, build the speed up gradually. It's better something that, you know, something goes wrong at a very low speed rather than a very high speed. Um, same for turning, same for some of the lathe work, you know. So I will wind that right on down. There we go. I'll plug it in. There we are. I'll get my safety specs. So if you need a little bit of rumbling now, apologies. It's me putting my specs over my microphone. There we are. That should be good. So let's turn the router on. Nice, slow, controlled speed now. And I'm going to bring the speed up 
at, uh, as I said, that 1600 RPM mark, nice and gradually, just to ensure that there's nothing untoward and I've done everything up tight enough. I'm going to introduce a bit of extraction, take away the waste, and we'll pop that on through, see what happens. Okay. Well, that's a nice clean cut. Look at that. All right. Hopefully, you got a good view of that. And you can see how clean it is in the entry. Now, exit, not so pretty, but we know we're going to get breakout there. There's a couple things we can do. We can accept the breakout and skim this little section off afterwards, or we can put a little packing board behind. How is that going to fit together? I've only made one cut there, so how are we going to test for fit? All right, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take it to the bandsaw and do a little slice. Two seconds, I won't be long. So, move the fence in, just take a little slice off. All right, so what I've got at that point is just a strip that I've cut off the end. Now I'm going to take this in half. I'm only going to do it freehand. There's no precision here on this cut. Let's just take it nice and steady. Okay. Now what I've got, we can get a camera three, Jace. These two bits. What you do them is flip one onto the other and check for alignment. Let's get away from the scruffy end, shall we? All right. You check for alignment. And what we're looking for, what I mean by alignment, are these two faces, one, two, level. Are they coming together? Certainly looks clean through there. You know, I think I got that first time. There's always, almost always a little micro adjustment you've got to do. This is a machine like this. And if you've got the cutter just a little bit too high or just a little bit too low, you'll end up with a little step in this area, a little step here. But this has come really good first off, just showing how precise and easy that setup really is. Finding cutter center, locating the material center and matching those two up. And then a nice, easy, quick setup, wasn't it, with the fence and the um, and the little ruler trick on the material that you're going to be machining. Well, there you go. I am really happy with that first off. But of course, it's not going to come together like that because I'm making a box. One bit has got it that you know they kind of got to go like that, and that clearly ain't going to work. It's great if you're board jointing. Now a lot of people think this is just a mitre box cutter, but what about if you're just edge to edge board jointing? You know, you see, uh, you see this cutter used a lot on, on that sort of work. But you could use this very cutter for that very job. It certainly looks neat if something is, is visible and you want to see it a little bit. Um, but it's super strong. Alignment, you can see, is crisp and good. Um, and it makes gluing up really easy because these come together so well. I think let's just get stuck in and make the box. Okay. So we're happy with that setup. I'm just going to get my four pieces, and here they are. Now, what I've done, I've set up using the end, the offcut of the pieces that I want to make the box out of. Always the best way. Or at least, you know, use an end, an offcut, or definitely use something that is the same dimension, the same thickness as what, what you're looking to work with. And another top tip, this is one. Keep a bit like this. It'll make your setup next time so much more simple because you can use this to set your cutter, cutter height and fence setup. All right. And a lot of woodworking workshops, you do get a lot of bits and bobs like this kicking around in drawers and on shelves and hung on the wall and stuff. And it's quick setup stuff, um, certainly with, with jointing cutters. And yeah, there are methods with measuring and stuff like I'm showing you here, but keeping a bit of this and just offering that up to the cutter is so simple. So, um, that bit is going to kind of stay with me, I think. Right. So let's have a look at this particular box. 
we've got four bits. All right. So that's our material. All right, you can see that. It's reasonably clean cut. And like I say, macrocarpa, it kind of machines quite well. Smells lovely. Um, it's it's like, oh, like I say, it's kind of like cedar, but not as splintery. It's good outside. Great for kind of garden furniture. You use kind of pressure-treated softwoods and um, some cedars for, for outside stuff. But this stuff's great also. Colwyn's got a question for me. Yeah, Maria's asking, could you use the mitre lock bit on birch ply? Yeah, that is a brilliant question, and I'm prepared for this, Maria. Great question. So the one thing to consider is obviously the, the thickness of birch ply. We use a fair amount, a lot of these backing boards and all this French cleat business going on here. That's all birch ply, and the most of that is 15 mil birch ply. So you'd be using the cutter I'm using here for that, for 15 mil, because that goes from 10 to 18. However, there's a particular way you must put the ply through. If you're looking for real clean cut, and um, if we can go back to number three, my friend, Jason. There you go, birch ply. How sweet and clean is that? I do get a little bit excited about kind of router cutters and joints. Colin and Jace, Ben, they're always reining me in. All right, calm down, Craig. All right, how clean is that? Look. Now, you kind of think with birch ply, there's not a grain direction. It's not real wood, is it? Well, it's made of real wood, and there is a grain direction. This is kind of on the outer skin. The, the, the posh bit, the nice bit you see, is running this way. I'm hoping you can kind of just about see that. So that's the direction of your travel. You're traveling the direction of the grain. If on birch ply you try and travel against the grain, well, you can see a little bit of splintering here just from a saw cut. That's going to happen in the extreme. Check this out. There's something seriously wrong with that, I know, and that's because against the grain, crossing the grain, look, that grain direction there. And as it's coming through, it's smashing that, that top surface, the birch ply bit, the posh bit. All right, it's not severing it cleanly. So you want to go that direction, not that direction. And then you think, well, it's okay, it's inside, I'll clean it up. But all these little shards, they all get in the way. All right. So when you're sliding on through, you know, you'll end up coming off the fence. And you can see I've got a few little, you know, curvy bits going on. And it just makes a mess. So... Birch ply is an absolute yes. Okay, so let's get to um, our material. You see we've got four equal pieces here, cut nice and square. Make sure it's cut square. If you want lovely box joints, lovely box corners that come together really well, it's got to be cut square. All right. So mitre saw is fine, table saw. Yeah, even bandsaw, if, you, if you've got something that, uh, that does cut square. Not all bandsaws cut square square. They can with a bit of fettling. But this is really clean. Like I say, 18 mil, cut clean and square. So I'm going to machine two bits first, one way, and then we've got to change setup slightly and do two bits in the vertical plane. So let's crack on with that. Now, if we're on small bits and we want to prevent breakout at the back here, we could introduce, where is it? Here we go. A little board like this, which sits on there. If we can go to two J's, please. All right there. That would sit there. Now, what we've got here is our backing board supporting this area, supporting the back of the cut, all right, preventing this from being snapped off. It also increases our surface contact with our fence and making it even more stable. I mean, these pieces are about six and a half inches, 160, 170 millimeters wide. So there's a good surface contact area with the fence. If you're doing little skinny bits, well, I think you might struggle a little bit, even with something like this, because they just want to rock and wobble. Why not do wider boards, then slice them down the middle, you'll end up with two boxes you can make. Another question. And Jim's just said this is perfect time. Mean he's just purchased that cutter. Oh, great stuff. I expect to see a box. Is that Jim? It's Jim, yeah. Can we see a box, Jim? Send me pictures. Woodworking Wisdom at axminstertools.com. 
And then GDB just said, um, could you scribe a line on the birch ply to prevent the tear out? It's going to help a little bit. It's difficult to know where to scribe that line. Um, I, I, there always going to be a bit of break out there. It's quite, you're removing a lot of material with this cut. I mean, that all that is being ripped out in one cut. All right. And it's quite a lot. And you could try and kind of guesstimate where to scribe that line. But, you know, you really want to be going kind of along the, 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 the face grain, if you like. Right. So I'm happy with my width of board. I'm not going to use this this time. All right. So our setup is, is ready. It's good to go. So let's just do that. Let's just turn some extraction on. Okay, so we're going through. Nice, steady, continuous pace. There's no rush. All right. Keeping the same face down. Same face down. And just turn the board round against the fence. And there we go. Now, as I'm coming through, when I get about halfway along the cut, I transfer my pressure to this side. All right, so if we can go to two, Jace. Let me just turn that off for a second. I'll explain what I mean. It's blown out a little bit. Now, what I mean, as I'm coming through, all the pressure I'm putting is to this side of the fence. When I get about halfway along the cut, I'll, it's only subtle pressure you've got to push to the fence. I'll transfer my pressure over to here. Because if I continue in pushing maybe on this corner, there's an opportunity, a chance that this corner will kick into the aperture between in the middle of the fence. So it's just a transfer of pressure. It's only light. All right. But there we are. So that's those two bits done and ready to go. Or two ends, should I say. Let's crack on and do the other two. Same face down against the fence, just change round end to end. And away we go. Okay. So, really, what we've got there now. Two ends ready to go. All right, so we can go to camera three. There we go. Two ends, a little bit of break out there. We know about that, but two ends ready to go. Now they're horizontal boards. Now we do the vertical boards. And another question. I was asking again, could you do that in more than one pass? You could do, yeah, you could eat your way into it. Um, on hard material, maybe you do that. It certainly probably wouldn't. Even, improve the clarity of cut but remember you've got to get back to that exact fence position the protrusion of the cutter through the table and protrusion of cutter through the fence is everything on this joint that's critical so if you want to take a little nibble away first great but make sure that second cut is your setup cut the final perfect cut using the kind of board and ruler trick that i showed you okay this kind of board and ruler trick I tend not to unless I'm working. I think, I think the only material I do tend to take a couple cuts is if I'm doing some some maple. I mean, some of it's like like concrete. There's a box here. There we are. This is it's not a mitolog box, so I know. You can go to three J's. This particular dovetail box I made a little while ago, walnut and maple. That maple was like concrete. And I really had to work my way into it, slow and steady. It's just maple. It's beautiful. I mean, the, the contrasts. I mean, the, the material I'm working on now is kind of the same sort of look and, and feel and color. But if you really want to make your joints pop out and, and make make an emphasis and a focus of the joint, just use two different color woods. Maple and walnut works well. Hello. Another question. Yeah, Colin was just asking, what does UJK stand for? 
Oh, it was a, a brand. So that's an Axminster brand. It's one of ours, and the majority of it is made in the UK. Um, not UJK, UK. Um, unique jointing kits. It came from um, when we first developed our own UK mage pocket hole jig. Um, there are many, many pocket hole jigs out there. Some are blue and very plastic. Um, we wanted one that was metal and precise and tough and rugged. Um, uh, we couldn't quite buy the one we wanted or couldn't find the one we wanted, so we decided to make it. We went over to our engineering department who made chucks and centers for decades, and we sat down, talked to them, invested in some new kit, new machines, and it's kind of taken off from there. Now the UJK range is developing. It's got some really cool stuff in it. There's something super cool going to be launched within the next few weeks that um, I'm hoping while well, I will be bringing to you in a video. But there's, there's lots of stuff from router tables. Uh, there's a lot of routing and clamping style products and, and uh, mitre fences and the path jig, of course, making up, you know, your, your, uh, your, your series of grid tables for, for clamping and accurately cutting stuff. There's, there's a huge range, of, but uh, yeah, unique jointing kit. All right. Okay. Let's get on. So we've done the two horizontal bits, nice and flat on the table. Easy, easy. Vertical bits. So we need to take this off. Now you haven't got to change any setup. Haven't got to change any setup at all. We don't need this. All right. But one thing to consider now, we've got a board that needs to go through end on. It needs to go through like that. All right, so we need some sort of pressure that way more than down to the fence now, uh, down to the table now. And there is a little risk that that could kind of wobble around a little bit. A couple of ways you can fix this. One of which, and I don't do it because I've got another fix for it, extend your fence. It build a tall fence to give you more support. It's just like, uh, being, you know, changing the fence on your bandsaw to the, the higher fence. For, for deeper resawing. It's the same sort of thing because you don't want that material to, to fold over the fence. There. Um, you could include some kind of, oh, where are they? There we go. Put them up there, nice and safe. You could imp include some of those. All right, so that gives you pressure. Like we had pressure down to the table, the all important now is pressure to the fence. We could include one of those. These work really well. Like you're saying, it works in the same way. The, the fingers flex and bend and push your material to the fence. Or, and for those of you that have seen a few of my videos, you know I like a good jig. And that's not me dancing around. Colin's having a little swing around in his chair there. Um, This little jig. So I've got a handle. I've got some grip tape. And I've got a little push block. There's actually a kind of hoping you can kind of see that there. There's the remains of, in fact, if we go to camera three, right? So my handle. This area here is where my timber sits. All right. This surface here is what pushes the material through. And you can see that I've cut into it a little bit. This gives the back the cut a little bit of support and help stop some of that breakout. Let me just give you a dry run on how it works. There we go. So you're there. You've got pressure to the fence. You've got pushing and that will just glide on through the cut. Really simple little thing. Nothing too complicated. All right. So let's just do the cut. All right. Remember now that we're not flipping the board round side to side. We're always working same side against the fence. So if you are making a box and there's a particular piece of figuring on the grain that you, that you really like, or a floor that you maybe want to hide inside the box, figure that now. This is the outside of the box. So outside, out. Same as with this. Outside, out. So you always see the good side. Okay, power on. Extraction on. Starting way away from the cut. I'm putting very light pressure down and I'm going to slide on through. Oh. 
let's see the results. Take that out of the way. Look at that. All right. So we've got that lovely clean cut coming in. There's the breakout. A little bit, but not a lot in comparison to the other cut because we had that supported. But as said, I generally would skim this off anyway. What about the fit? The all-important fit. All right. Ready? This is the ooh-ah moment. I'm waiting for an ooh-ah from, from Colwood or Jace. All right. Oh, Colwyn's there. Look, he's loving it. All right. I get excited about routing and router cutters. Like he gets excited about turning. I don't get his. He don't get mine, really. All right. So look at that. We know that's good. That's because we paid attention to that setup. Center of the cutter. And then finding the right uh, fence position before with a little rule and the block trick. So I'm happy with that. So I'm going to continue with the other cuts. All right. Router on. And once you've got this done, once you've got your setup done, and you're not chatting to somebody while you're doing it, this can become really quick to do. You know, if you're making a bunch of boxes, Christmas is coming, Make some jewelry boxes for folks, some keep take boxes. What a lovely way of doing it. And there we go. The moment of truth, as they say. Those two bits. All right. So let's have a look. Let's pop that bit in there like that. And we get that bit in there. Got that breakout. That's okay. We know about that. And that. And that bit in there like that. What an easy way to make a box. If we can go overhead, Jace, we'll go to two. Let's turn that around like that. There you go. All right. And clamping is so easy. It's just that. It kind of finds its own square. It's really quick and easy to do. Now, what you could do from this, I mean, this is quite a deep, quite a big box, isn't it? All right. It's quite a big box. What about now you've done this machining, slice it in half. On your table saw or band saw, each piece equally and make two boxes. Okay. So as said, the mitre lock cutter is a super strong, easy, easy method. Now you can, as said, you can you can try and emphasize that cut. All right. If we can go to three again, Jace, you can try and emphasize that cut. I mean, this one shows up a little bit just by grain pattern, really. You can see it's a little bit darker here than this, and you can really see that joint come together. I have done it on a couple of other jobs that I didn't really want to see. I wanted it strong, but I didn't want to see the cut. All right? This is a kind of little display that we made to display some of the UJK stuff for the show back back along. Um, but I made this box with the mitre lock. So if we can go to three again, there you go. That corner is a mitre lock corner almost completely invisible just showing with with good clamping and you know material that's the same kind of color and texture it can be invisible oh we've got another question sort of questions um so uh, lena was just saying so that means that with the one setup you can make as many boxes as you go 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 yeah as long as you're working on the same material thickness each time i mean i like to work with 16 or 18 mil material for for a lot of stuff um you know, and that middle size cutter that we sell just covers most stuff for me. I do make a lot of boxes. As you can see, we've got the dovetail box there. And this this pile of timber behind us will end up boxes um, for a, a, a different project, but the same sort of idea. Um, so, yeah, one setup. I mean, how long did the setup really take? Ten minutes? Once you get your head around it and you know that hopefully the quick tips that I've showed you, you're straight into it. 
a lot of times if you're making one box of setups takes longer than the than the run through if you're making a batch you know what about just running off a load of this stuff and making a load of boxes it's terrific another question um there's quite a few questions now we're going to start with maria because she gave you an o and an r oh um I I wasn't expecting the R. Yeah. So Thank you very says, much. She um, admits that she's very impace, impatient. And can we give a date for the new UJK dovetail jig? That was from Maria. I never put any spoilers out. You didn't. I, I'm kind of sworn to secrecy. However, it will be within the next month. Can I say that? I probably just got myself in trouble there. Um. It, it's a super exciting bit of kit. Um, I've been developing it myself. Um, it's how about the first ever UK made dovetail jig? There's never been one made in the UK before and it's made across the road. I can literally almost see where it's made. So super exciting. We want to bring stuff manufacturing back to the UK in, in our own little way, making good quality tools we've been making chucks for years um this you know the, the jig's been about probably about a year and a half two years in development to be honest and we've added some supersonic stuff to it um and it's really cool so within the month hopefully okay uh question from mike what's the thinnest timber that you can um use with the small cutter nine mil so three eighths of an inch is 9.5 if you're working in old money my friend um, uh, Leonard is asking if you can use the cutter on a handheld router. No, no. A um, couple of reasons. One, the the size really. Um, you can have a bit more control, uh, and the tiniest little wobble with your router, and there's there's a gap in your joints. You will you will experience a gap, kind of halfway along your joint. That will be you know the frustration for you. So it's really router table use this one, and particularly when. When you're going on to um, a beastie like this, which is a super cool cutter, and this is what did the, um, oh, excuse me, that's what did that. You know, it's a slightly thicker material. Um, but yeah. And another one. Yeah, one more. And Frederick was asking, are the cutters easy to sharpen? Do you need any specialist equipment? No, router cutters generally are really easy to sharpen. Um, why don't I show you right now? So let's get our box. I love the smell of this macro you might not agree to, with some people like cedar doesn't i mean i know ben kind of reacts a little bit to it but i love it i went after cutting this the other day i went on my clothes smelt of it as well it's like a little quite a fresh foresty smell so sharpening router cutters or sharpening this particular router cutter um what we're gonna do we'll introduce now it's the same as sharpening most router cutters um let's go down to camera three he's already there beautiful right what we're looking to do i mean you've got a really intricate profile here this shape is ground it's got a bevel edge on it like kind of like a chisel you can see that all right nigh on impossible for joe blogs to sharpen now, it's something I used to do for a living years ago, kind of grind, regrind, sharpen router cutters and all kind of cutters and tooling. Um, and you really kind of stay away from this shape. But you've got a nice big flat face in here. And that's the face you want to sharpen. That's the bit. So top tip is to, is to black it out. Get your black marker pen in there. Like a, like a lot of sharpening, really. Then you can see where you've removed material and where you've not. This is a good bit, a good bit of kit, a little diamond lap. This particular one is about eight, nine quid, I think. It's got a few different grades. You've got 120, 180, other end, 240, 320. I only ever use the 320, the fine grade on sharpening route cutters. And it's got to be diamond to handle and be able to remove material on this really hard carbide. It's really only diamond that, that handles and, and grinds and cuts carbide well. And what we're doing is finding a flat surface in there and just gently keeping that flat on there. 
if you lift it like that, well, you're nowhere near the cutting edge, you're not doing anything. If you kick it over like that, well, you're blunting, not sharpening, because you're altering that. You're taking this corner off that, where the two angles meet. So keeping that flat there, slow and steady. And what I'll do, I'll maybe do 10 strokes to one side of the cutter, and then 10 strokes to the other side of the cutter, just to keep everything equal and balanced. And that's the easiest and best way to sharpen all router cutters at home. If you get them real, I mean, little and often is always the best way to sharpen. We all talk about it in here. Little and often, touch it up, touch it up, touch it up. Before it gets black and burnt and really messy, then maybe you've got to go and get it professionally ground. Um, again, which I used to do, which is done with diamond. It's done with diamond wheels. Um so that is kind of top tip on sharpening. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, and that's the way to do it. Right. Okay. Are we any more questions? All right, Kate, questions. All right, guys. Well, that feels kind of short and sweet, but it just shows you how simple it is, really, with this cutter. A lot of people struggle with this cutter, and we do get a lot of questions from our customers. How to. Um, hey, you know how to. Um Really strong, dead square, effective boxes with the Mitolock cutter. Thank you guys for watching. I've enjoyed your company. Thanks for your questions. If you get any more questions, please, you know where we are, woodworkingwisdomandoxminstertools.com. And um, we'll see you next week, Tuesday, 3 o'clock. Thanks very much. Bye now. <laughs>